All right, so welcome to yet another video on the topic of radioactivity uh, from the ninth lecture of the fifth week. First of all, we're going to start by crediting our professor, Professor Varig, for providing us with such useful lecture slides. Thank you, Professor. And what we're going to start doing is, first of all, review the mass defect idea. And I'm just going to touch on what we need to understand and get an intuition as to what is a mass defect and why it happens in a decay process. What is the idea of total binding energy and what is a half-life including the different, the different uh, uh, respective definitions that we need for biophysics. So by all means, let's get started. Mass defect. And by now, we should know that in a decay, in a typical decay process, I have my mother nucleus and let's say it's a beta negative decay and I have my daughter nucleus here and in beta negative we're emitting a beta negative particle which is an electron and obviously this is not drawn to scale and an anti an electron anti neutrino now let's consider this response we know that the mother nucleus is unstable and it's going to a more stable and I'm, I'm not writing stable I'm writing more stable because the daughter nucleus could also, uh, it may or may not be radioactive itself. And whenever we're going from an unstable to a more stable uh, position, we are going to from a more energetic, from a more energetic transition to a more stable, less, less energetic transition. And at this point, we are always going to lose energy. We're just going to write energy is lost energy is lost. And just by quoting our favorite physicist saying that there is an equivalency between mass and energy, this basically means, I'm not going to interpret the equation obviously, but this means that energy has some sort of equivalency to mass. So if I'm losing energy, I must be in some form losing mass. And how does that happen? What do I mean? Basically, the whole idea of a mass defect says, hey guys, if I take this antineutrino and I add it up to this electron, and I add it up to this, uh, to this daughter nucleus, I add up all the masses of all these three constituents, I'm not going to get the mass of the mother nucleus. I'm going to have some mass missing, and that is the mass defect. This is the mass defect. So I have a change in energy here, and also a defect in mass that is lost. So I can write it as so if I have the if I take the daughter nucleus mass and the beta particle mass and the mass of the uh, electron antineutrino and I add the mass defect, this is the mass defect of the decay process, then I'm going to have the mass of the mother nucleus. So being that I'm losing energy in this process because I'm going from an unstable to a more stable uh, situation, you can say. In this event, energy is going to be liberated, and we know that a lot of energy is associated with radioactivity. So being that I'm losing energy, I'm really also, in effect, losing mass. And that is the mass defect of a decay process. Hopefully, I, uh, I was able to, uh, to get that point across. And now what I want to talk is, uh, is about <coughs> nuclear or uh, total binding energy. And the idea of a total binding energy is, let's just say I have some nucleons here in my nucleus. <coughs> and these nucleons, we know, are held together very tightly by forces, nuclear forces, or a strong nuclear force, or a strong interaction force. And what I can do is that I can take potentially the entire energy that is uh, attaching or, or, um, or is attracting all of my nucleotides. I take the energy and I divide it by the number of nucleotides I have. Let's say here I have six. And then I would get the total, total energy, the total binding energy per nucleon. So that's the idea that, uh, that this graph depicts. There's a total binding energy per nucleon. And the higher this number is, the higher uh, more energy is, uh, is uh, holding together nucleon, the more stable my isotope is going to be. So if I'm looking at this graph here, the further I am, the higher up I am on the y-axis, on the total binding energy per nucleon, the more stable my isotope is going to be. And let's consider the one at the top, which is iron 56, 
iron 56 here. It's the one at the top of the list. So iron 56, I believe, has 26 protons. And, and by law of elimination here, we know that we have 30 neutrons. So we have 30 neutrons and we have 26 protons. And if we take a look at the factors that we discussed, 1 to 1.6 ratio of protons to neutrons, this guy is not too far uh, it's not too far from this ratio. So it's going to be pretty stable. And also we know that if we have an even amount of protons, an even amount, even amount of neutrons, we are ideally going to see uh, the most amount of stable isotopes. And that means this guy also follows the, these rules. So it's pretty fairly stable, which is good. Now, if we take a look at all the isotopes that are on the right side of iron here or below, we will see that they're always going to be associated with a lower, a lower rating on my Y scale, a lower rating on the binding energy per nucleon. This means that all of these, all of these nucleus, all of these nuclei are not as stable as iron. And iron is always a good idea to remember to whenever they're asking about explain the uh, the factors affecting uh, the nucleus's stability. You can always say, well, there's this ratio and there's, there's this idea and we can always say oh this guy is pretty stable because it kind of fulfills these two terms to a very great extent. Now it just so happens that these guys that have a higher mass number they would tend to decay or this is called fission. They would tend to disintegrate. They would tend to break apart and these guys that are lower in the mass the number scale would tend to fuse this is actually uh, the principle a hydrogen bomb is actually built on fusion, which is kind of interesting in itself. And now that we've understand this graph of what what the whole binding energy per nucleon means, let's take a look at uh, this very interesting, very important graph that is also brought to us by uh, Professor Vera in his presentation. Thank you, Professor. So what we're what we're seeing here is first of all on the y-axis I have my number of protons, my z. And on the y-axis, I have number of neutrons, which is mass number minus uh, atomic number. And what I see here is that in the middle, in the middle of this whole line, the one that I'm drawing now, I have a, some sort of a, a, gray, a gray shade. And this gray shade means that I'm having all these guys are stable isotopes. And this line, if you draw this line and you solve for the ratio, you will see that the ratio stands right around 1 to 1.6. So we know that all these guys are pretty much stable isotopes and they pretty much fulfill this, this condition. Good. And now let's consider what happens to the pink, to the whole pink column and the whole or rather row or uh, vector here and the whole yellow group here. We know that the yellow group here Essentially, wherever I am, let's just say I'm over here. I, I really want to be on the on this line, on this on this stable line. So, if you can imagine that have, having this this gray line going right through the middle, if I'm here, I really want to be somewhere on this line. So, how do we move to get to that line? Let's just say I'm this isotope that undergoes beta positive decay, and beta positive decay is basically losing a proton. So all these guys are going to be are going to be going uh, going down the x-axis to get to that stable point. And if you want to, you can pause this video and think about it. You have beta positive decay, which means that a uh, proton is turning into a neutron, so we're losing one proton. So we're going down the x-axis. And I encourage you to stop, pause here, and think about it, and make sure that you have it solved in your mind. And if we're looking at the beta negative, all these pink guys. Beta negative is basically gaining, is basically gaining a proton. So they're going right to get to that line in the middle, whereas the, the whole beta positive group is going left to get to that middle ground that is very stable. And again, I do encourage you to kind of pause and think, okay, beta negative does this, beta positive does this. So they're going to the right or to the left on the x-axis. Very good. And you can obviously imagine that all this group of the alpha particles are actually going down the entire, the entire right and left because they're losing both. But this is kind of uh, kind of something that we can we can easily uh, we can easily understand. So this is what is going on with that graph, and I'm going to finish off 
with the ideas of half-life and this this is a definition that I took from Wikipedia and I don't use Wikipedia often but I do find their definitions to be pretty much spot on at least when we're talking about generic cases so it is the period half-life is a time the period of time it takes the amount of a substance undergoing decay to decrease by half it's pretty simple to say that let's let's say I have a sample here and it has uh, let's just say um, it has carbon, carbon-14, and if I'm not mistaken, it has a half-life of around, oh, I don't know, 5,000, uh, I want to say 5,470, but don't grab me on it. I don't really remember. It could be 5,740 or anything along those lines, but roughly 5,000 years. So I know that if I have this amount of carbon-14 after that specific half-life of roughly 5,000 years, I can expect to have half of that material, and it doesn't really have to be divided half down the middle, but it's going, I'm going to have half, half of that carbon-14 in my sample, and effectively another half-life time period, I'm going to have half of this, so you can imagine I will have considerably less, but you can imagine that half-life could just continue on and on and on, indefinitely because you can always have something that you can split in half obviously you can not split an atom in half but you can theoretically keep on going with this and this is how we do carbon dating and if you're interesting about what carbon dating is Khan Academy has quite quite a, quite an interesting can me has quite an interesting uh, video about it so just Google Khan Academy and uh, or just uh, and just search in their engine carbon dating and now we really, uh, for our biophysics course, we need to understand what physical, biological, and effective half-lives are. Physical half-life basically says the period of time, physical is the period of time it takes for the amount of a substance undergoing decay to decrease by half by means, by means of radioactive decay. By means of radioactive decay and that's a physical half-life because radioactive decay is a physical process so um, basically a physical half-life is how long does it take my isotope to degrade to half of its amount just by the means of physical decay of radioactivity and what is biological half-life <coughs> we can understand that it has something to do with the biological processes and that is true so it's the period of time uh, it takes for the amount of a substance undergoing decay to decrease by half by means, or rather by biological means. Biological means is really excretion, excretion or secretion. I want to put an S here, excretion. Don't take, uh, don't take spelling lessons for me. So this is biological half-life. And you can imagine what happens if I'm putting Take the concept, if I'm taking a, part, a element that, or rather an isotope that undergoes uh, radioactive decay and I'm placing it in a biological sample, then we're going to have a brand new idea called effective half-life. And effective half-life is essentially the time by which, period of time by which it takes the amount of substance undergoing decay to decrease by half by means of either physical or biological means. And that is the effective half-life. So you can imagine that if if uh, if I take the physical half-life, physical I'm just going to physical half-life, half-life, physical half-life, and I add it with the biological half-life, I'm going to get the effective the effective half-life. I'm going to see it represented soon. And this means that the uh, effective half-life is always going to be shorter. Is always going to be shorter than these half-lives because it's made of them. Think of it if I can if I can decay in five seconds, but I can be expelled in less than that, then the half-life associated with both of these processes is going to be shorter. So the effective half-life is shorter than these constituents. And I know it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, so I'm going to make it a whole lot more sensible using this great uh, great graph. Uh, brought to us 
by a professor varied as well. And I know that this graph doesn't, doesn't scream out simplicity right away, so we're going to take our time with it. Let's just say, and this is on this axis, I have an amount of time, amount of time, and on this axis, I have the amount of material. And you can imagine that this is, this is, let's just point it here. If I draw this down the line here, this is 50% of our material is left. That means I had 100% of this point. The graph starts from 100% and slowly I'm going down and, oh, look at this, I only have 50% left. So I can consider this a half-life and I can consider this the half-life, but we're just going to discuss this one. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens here. So I move down and I know that I have 50%. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move right on the time axis and I'm going to see how long it took me to uh, get to my effective biological and physical half-life. Well, I can see right out the bat that the, biolog the effective half-life, which is the addition, the effective half-life is the addition of the physical and biological half-life, occurred the quickest, took the least amount of time. And we can see that the physical took a little bit longer and the biological took a little bit longer. We don't really need to compare these two because they vary, but what we need to know is that this one, the effective half-life, is always going to be quicker. And it doesn't really matter what point I'm looking at in the graph. If I'm looking at 50% at of this, this value, so this is another half-life, 50% of this value here, I can see that it takes me the quickest to get to that, uh, to 50% in the means of effective half-life a little bit more in the means of physical, a little bit more in the means of biological. And initially we had this half-life and we had the rest of the time required. And when you think about it, when you think about it, I can keep splitting this up. I can keep splitting this up to half and half and half and half and keep on, keep on going. So what you really need to understand from, uh, from this graph is that if I take batter and I split it by 50, and this is my half-life 1 over 2, and this is my half-life, I can go down the timeline and see that I can achieve that quickest by effective half-life, or I can calculate it by either biological and effective, and this is what you need to bear in mind. Effective half-life is the combination or the combination of the physical and the biological half-life. Ergo, it would be the quickest way or to calculate or to solve for how quickly a substance would be expelled uh, or reduced by half of its original amount by means of either physical or biological uh, means. So hopefully you found this helpful. And again, I encourage you to use the lecture slides because Dr. Vera did do a very good job of putting the pieces together. And I'll see you in the next video.